you know, who could come in and really teach them where they'd walk out of here and their relationship would never be the same. And I thought of Matt immediately. This guy, in my opinion, is the top relationship therapist probably in the entire country. Happens to be here in Utah. And I've sent probably 20 friends to him over the years. And every single one of them, like, will hit me back. They're like, where did you even find this guy? Who is this? Um, he's that good. And he's got a really fun presentation. You never know where it's going to go with Matt, but I promise you it'll change your lives. I'm going to encourage you guys to go all in, just like you did. You guys were an excellent crowd, by the way, this morning. Couldn't have been more proud watching you guys bought all in. You stayed in your seats. You stayed off your phones. You guys were awesome. So without further ado, let's get to Mr. Matt Townsend. Oh, wow. How are you? Are you ready for this? Any of you in a relationship? What? A couple of you aren't. Do you, any of you um, realize or know, have a situation in your life where the person that is closest to you does not get how great you are? No matter how hard you tell them, right? Do any of you ever um, run into somebody that you kind of wish you didn't have to relate to? How many of you are married to them? Any of that going on? Any of you have a situation in your life where um, you knew if, they, if the people would just listen to you and if they would just recognize how awesome you are and shut their cake hole, that you could change their life. You could take the business to another level. You could create something really powerful. That's what we're going to talk about is how to get people to shut their cake hole. No, because you're not in charge of that. We're going to see if we can find a way to relate to people in such a way that your life starts to magnify and you start magnifying more and you start creating more and being more and elevating to a different level. And um, now here's the deal. When we talk about this stuff, it's always weird. So what I found is the best way to actually make, um, you know, get the skills out there, get them in your hearts, get them in your minds. One of the fastest ways to do that is to realize that we're not talking about you. Okay, so whenever I'm up here, I'm not talking about you and your problems. I'm talking about the person on your right, okay? Because they're jacked up. We know that, okay? Some of you brought them. And um, some of you didn't. Some of you just met him today. So anytime I say something, just know I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the one on the right. But here's the deal as we get into this. Is that, um, by the way, if your coworkers are here, your best friends are here, they might already know how jacked up you are. And you might be on their right. And so we'll have a really good conversation tonight. When we, what, when we also get into this today, and, and we're going to spend a lot of time um, and so I really want you to be open. I want you to be willing to work on like your own thinking, your own relationships. Take everything I'm going to say through that filter and ask yourself, what's it like? This is one of the most powerful communication relationship questions I've ever come up with or found. What is it like to be in a relationship with you? What is it like to deal with you all day? Oh, it's beautiful. My wife is so lucky to have me. It, is she? Is she? And really, let's get real about that. Because if, if you're not good at relationships, guess what you are? You're normal. I don't know if you know this, but right now, 60%, 60% of millennials have attachment issues. They have a hard time safely attaching to other people. Do any of you know of those people? They have a hard time being vulnerable. They have a hard time sharing what's most important in their heart. So relationships are hard. And it's weird, right? Because they're, they're supposed to be so natural, aren't they? Like childbirth, just natural. <laughs> I've, had, I've watched my wife have six children. Nothing natural about it. <laughs> it's absolutely terrifying. Six times. Okay. I'm in awe. I could never do it myself, never would want a kid if I had to do any of that. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about some of the differences today. Um, some of my favorite differences are very unique, specific differences about men and women. Some of them are just people. Any of you introverts? 
Okay, now in this audience, it's probably 40%. It may not be, because maybe we have a more extroverted audience. But in general, 40% of the population are more introverted. 60% are extroverted. That just means how you vert, right? It's all about your verting. Some of you like to vert out. Some like to vert in. Some ambiverts, you'll vert anywhere, okay? You'll just vert all over, right? But the vert is about how you convert energy, some of you get energy alone. Inside of yourself, you get your energy by yourself. When I leave today and I'm driving home in my car, I'll get a lot of energy. I'm an ambivert. Some of you get energy with people, right? And some of you lose the energy with people. So that's just a title. It's not who you are. But it would be really good to know if you're an ambivert or an extrovert or an introvert. Um, my wife last night had a chance to go to a dinner party with me that I told him I couldn't go to already because I don't, I don't want to vert. <laughs> I didn't have the energy to vert last night and because um, I knew I have this and then I have a really big speech I do every year um, it, for my Valentine's Day. It's, it's called a date night with Matt and I have to create all this new content. So I have like a thousand people coming and I want to work on that and she had a Galentine's party don't even know why. Um, why would you want to have a party with your friends on Valentine? I don't know. Um, Galentine's party and this thing with me. And she wrote me desperate at six o'clock. So I need to know if I should go to the Galentine's party or if, we, or if we're going to go to this dinner. But I didn't get the message till about 7.10. <laughs> Sheesh. 7.10. I saw the message because I was with clients. And when I saw the message, I'm like, oh, boy. So I wrote her immediately, go to the Galentine's party. Go, 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 go. <laughs> I'll have to sadly figure out my own night working on my project. And um, she didn't answer. But you know what that means? You are screwed. <laughs> and, um, and she didn't answer. And so I wrote her back. And I'm like, are you going to the Galentine's party? I think it'd be so fun. No answer. About 20 minutes later, she wrote back, I can't, I can't go, it's too late now. You've ruined my night. She didn't say you've ruined my night. She said, but why aren't we going to that event, that, that other dinner thing? And I'm like, I already told them we couldn't go because they wanted me to speak at it and I couldn't go. So I said, I'm not, I can't go. Now I can't go because I was supposed to speak. And she's like, well, you could still go. They'll understand. And in my head, I'm like, ah, no, no, me no want to go. And I realized right as I'm reacting to it, I turned into a little eight-year-old boy. Like, what the flip? Let's just sit, let's, let's just sit home. Doesn't our son have a basketball game? Junior Jazz, let's go watch basketball. What time is that? I was kind of hoping we'd missed it. Um, but he, she's like, it's at nine. Ugh. Well, I'll just come home. And well, what are we supposed to do all night? I'm like, well, we could always just cuddle. I said that. And she's like, it never is just cuddle. <laughs> never. Never. Well, I'm like, what if I promised this time it was just cuddle? What if we handcuffed me? Oh, what if we, what if, what if we just shackled? No. Um, then I just realized we could just watch TV while I work on my PowerPoint. She was mad. She was disappointed. And what I learned at eight years old, I, I don't know if any of you know this. My parents divorced when I was eight. So at eight years old, I learned very young that people you love could leave you. So you better learn to dance like a monkey and make people like you. Do any of you do that? Do any of you try extra hard to be liked? Do any of you go way above and beyond what needs to be done just to be liked? And some of you don't. Because you don't, your fight or flight wasn't turned on to be loved. You just your flight may have been. Some of you just say, well, stick it. If you don't love me the way I am, then stick it. 
and you just run from the relationships. Do any of you know these people? They run. And some try to please the other to death. And in one relationship, you got pleasers, and then you got the runners, the avoiders. And we're doing it because I needed to be loved when I was eight. And I needed to feel like I was capable when I was eight. My family, my parents divorced. My mom and three sisters raised me. My dad was around. I saw him all the time. I'd go work for my dad, slave labor back then. Remember? Remember back when you could employ your children? Not pay any of them? Those are the good old days. That's also when we didn't have seat belts. Remember those days? And you could sit in the back of a truck and they'd try to bounce you all over the back of a truck. Oh, I love the good old days. Do you remember when human life was so devalued? Those were the days. Do you remember those days? And now we value all these lives. So I'm sitting there as, a, as an eight-year-old boy and my parents are divorcing. I remember sitting in the back room of my little 1800 square foot house hearing my parents argue. And at eight years old, I knew I wanted to help people learn to talk. I knew it. Like, why can't these two get this together? They're good people, what's their problem? But my parents divorced and at eight years old, you can't go get a degree. When I got old enough too, I wanted a degree. But what's the degree that you get to help people learn to talk? Back then, there wasn't a degree. I, so I thought, maybe I'll be a lawyer. And then I met some. <laughs> They're scary. They're so scary. And then I thought, I'll be a therapist. And then, have any of you heard of Freud? That guy's jacked up. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't want to be a Freudian jacked up guy. So there wasn't a job back then. So weirdly, what I did is I went and got a job. Uh, I got a bachelor's in journalism, communications. And then I went and got a master's degree in conflict resolution. Ha <laughs> ha, now I'm gonna start to learn to talk and get people talking. So I did that, worked for a company for years you may have heard of called Franklin Covey. Actually got to work with Stephen Covey. Uh, traveled all over the country teaching executives about some stuff we're gonna talk about today. About relationships, synergy, how you actually create synergy, how you do more with less. Worked with huge companies, big companies, Honda of America, Hewlett Packard, the Army, the Navy, one of my last gigs ever at Franklin Covey. I was sitting in a room a little bigger than this with about 40 admirals of the Atlantic fleet and the, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff member from the Air Force, no, the Navy, and the Chief Naval Officer, who's on the Joint Chiefs, and their staff, and a bunch of military police. It was the coolest room ever in Emerald City. And we were talking about the number one thing bringing um, our Navy to its knees. And anybody, can anyone guess? About 20 years ago, it was the Tell Hook scandal where we won't even get into it, but it was a scandal and it involved scandal. <laughs> I don't even want to tell you, it was just nasty. And what they realized is they couldn't get enough people to join the Navy because it was so hard on family relationships. So I'm teaching the chief naval officer and the joint, or, uh, and 40 admirals about how to build relationships in the Navy. Because the minute you're in the Navy, you're out for six months, you're gone. How do you build a relationship that way? And all of a sudden it dawned on me, hey, maybe what I ought to do is just start my own practice and start teaching the people the skills that I've got. And that's how this thing started 25 years ago. Um, well, 20 years ago total. And then what I've done since is I got another master's degree. You know why? And a PhD, not to brag, but I'm a doctor. Okay? And no, I won't check your mole. So put your nasty mole away and just focus on communication. And what I, what I did, though, with all these degrees, by the way, most of them I didn't need, but my little eight-year-old boy did because I didn't know if I was lovable and I didn't know if I was capable. I didn't know if I belonged and I didn't know if I was safe. My mom wasn't safe because we didn't have enough money. I wasn't capable because not one of my family members had ever gone to college. And then finally, my older sister went to college. I married into a family where they're all doctors. Number one, trained residents at Johns Hopkins, which is I think the top med school, uh, Harvard and Duke. 
Those are my brother-in-laws. <laughs> so I got a doctorate. They call me Dr. Matt. And my father-in-law, just not meaning to, but just as father-in-laws do, said, well, you know, you're not a real doctor. Because he's a doctor too. So guess what I thought right then? I hate you. And I'm just not going to like you. And by the way, it didn't just bug me then because you know what it made me feel? It made me feel my little eight-year-old boy again. Where everybody said, oh, you're that Townsend kid? Yeah, I'm the Townsend kid. Yeah. Hello, my parents are divorced. I felt weird. Any of you feel that? Can any of you feel the situation where you didn't feel lovable, capable, belong, and not safe? Welcome to Attachment 101. And if you feel it and you pick it up when you're young at eight years old, guess what I do? I build a script at eight and it's there to save me. And the minute I'm vulnerable, fight or flight turns on. So now every single time somebody says something that makes me question my capability, like even my wife, why'd you do it that way? Oh, jeez. <laughs> That's my eight-year-old. Why'd I, What? Why'd you park there? You could have parked there. Oh my gosh. Why don't you shut it there instead of talking about it here? <laughs> Just shut it there. Jeez. And then she's like, you're so rude. I'm not rude, but that was rude. Asking a question. Yeah. Oh, so I can't ask questions. Exactly. Shut it. None of it has anything to do with what we're talking about. That's my little eight-year-old being questioned. And what my little eight-year-old learned to do is everything an eight-year-old knows how to do. Tell her to shut up, fat cow. I learned that when I was eight. Don't use it. It's kind of aged out. But my sisters certainly didn't like it. And it gave me a lot of power for about a minute. And then I had to run really fast. It's a relationship, and I learned it back then. I learned when I have a raw emotional situation what to do. But I learned it at eight, when I have no voice, and I have no tools, and I have no skills, and I have no power, and I have no ability. So I now still sometimes react like my eight-year-old self. And my wife will even point it out. Like, she's, like is your little eight-year-old here? Yeah! Shut up! Fat cow. <laughs> now, I've learned a whole other thing. We'll show you what to do with it. But it's 60% of us have this. Now, I know you don't. Duh. But the person on your right, they totally do. Don't even look at them. That'll make them vulnerable. And so anytime you're vulnerable, fight or flight goes off. But it goes with a script that is just ignorant. I don't have to, oh, huh. And I don't have to just fight you. And I don't have to run from you. What I need to learn to do is stay in the space. Stay in the space between. You can't change a space that you're not in. You can't influence a life that you're not a part of. So if you're running too much, it's probably a sign of an attachment. If you're hiding too much, it's probably a sign of an attachment issue. Get used to it. This is how, this is how it works. In fact, we're even finding it may be a universal principle of psychology. The world may not be full of just a bunch of narcissists. <laughs> Have you noticed? Every, everyone is one. That's why they're actually using it less in the DSM-5 manual. They don't like diagnosing people with narcissism because everyone's got it. So it's not as big. Now, there's real narcissism. But a lot of times when you act like an eight-year-old that's about to be hurt, it looks very narcissistic. And it's somebody that doesn't know how to be mature with another human. So that's what we gotta work on today. And it's gonna be just three hours, but it'll feel like eight. <laughs> Not for you, but for the guy on the right. They'll just be vibrating in their seat. You know what I mean? So that's what we're gonna get into today. And I would love you to start to, and, and I, you'll see, I mean, I'm not gonna, I won't embarrass anybody, but I would love this to get very real, right? And I'm gonna even show you a model called Get Real. It's so cool. And I'm going to show you how to quit fighting about the thing that's not the thing. 
and how to get out of the smoke and down to the real fire. And I learned that as a mediator watching thousands of divorces. You won't believe this, guys, but when people divorce, they hate each other. <laughs> they hate each other. And then the little eight-year-olds are the ones divorcing. Meanwhile, while they're dividing up the kids, and they're doing it as eight-year-olds, and then we hand these traditions down. And it never ends until when? Till you change. Oh, so it's me. Yeah. Oh, it's always me. Yeah. Or not, you don't have to do it. Just keep sucking it up until you die. Dry up on the vine like a little raisin. Bloop. Just do that. But if you know how to do what we're going to show you to do in a relationship, it gives you all the power to make an improvement. What it will at the least do is you'll feel better because you're no longer part of your problem. And the minute you can see more clearly the pattern that's going on, the system that's at play, super powerful. So that's what we're going to talk about. Now, let's get into you for a sec. I went to Aruba and... Um, I took a picture off the back of a boat. This is the most amazing picture. In fact, you're probably going to want to take a picture of this picture. This is the hardest shot. I, I think you'll only get a one in a million chance to catch this picture. But to me, it perfectly typified you or me and my most important relationships. So I want you to think in your life right now, you and think of your most important relationships. In fact, will you take a second and write them down? What are the two, three, four most important relationships in your life that you want some improvement on? You need to identify them, right? Because each one's going to have a little different dynamic. Who are the people that you really care about the most? And, and you might even want to make sure you identify one that's a little strained. One that's a little off. You got it? And if you had just, if you look at the list of three or four and maybe the one plus the plus one that's strained, which one of them do you most want to improve? And it could be any one of them. Maybe circle that one. And then as we go through today, let's think about that relationship. And you're going to see I'll use a lot of different examples of relationships. And one of the best ways I've ever found to teach is to actually channel voices. So I will use different voices sometimes. You'll see me just break into something emotional. And when I break into the voice, sometimes that's just me thinking. Sometimes that's me um, trying to be something different for you to kind of relate to, okay? Now, here's the picture. This is you and that one person that you most want to work on. And when you see it, I want you to just quickly identify in the picture which one is you and which one is the other person, okay? Are you ready? Boom! Okay. So when I see that picture, I think I'm the cow. And my wife is the incredible skinny. Look at her waist. Oh my gosh. She's got the tiniest little, her nose, don't look at her nose. It's a little long. But her waist, so petite. That's my wife and I, relationally. She just does it gracefully, elegantly, naturally. She didn't grow up with an attachment issue. She actually felt loved by her parents and her siblings. Even in high school, she had it. What the flip, man? <laughs> like, even in high school? Yeah, well, yeah. Um, she felt capable. She felt like she belongs. She felt safe. Those are, the, those are the kind of the basic attachment needs. Lovable, capable, belonging, and safe. She had it. I didn't. So I felt like I had to learn it. And that's the cow. And you got to really love the cow. Because look how hard he's working. He's killing it. Do you know how hard it is to get a cow that far out of the water? That ain't easy, guys. So for some of you, relating's easy. It's natural. It's, I'm going to bet it's part of your skill set. You're born with some gifts there. I found out, um, and if you ever want to do this, there's a great website. Go to the website, AuthenticHappiness.org. AuthenticHappiness.org. I didn't think I was going to share this with you. And at AuthenticHappiness.org, you'll go to the University of uh, Pennsylvania. 
and you will take a test on that site. You can do it for free, and you will take a test called the VIA Character Strengths Assessment. VIA Character Strengths Assessment. Most important assessment I've ever taken in my life, because what it will tell you is what are your character strengths? Not your traits, not your personality strengths. What is your character strength? And my number one character strength, second to rugged good looks, is, don't know why you're laughing, um, is social intelligence. I read people really well. By the way, my whole life I have. In high school, I'd sit with the cheerleaders and we'd talk about their boyfriends on the field. <laughs> Back then it felt like rejection, but um, <laughs> like, oh, I'm not lovable enough because I'm not dumb enough to get killed out there. And instead, I'm going to sit by the hotties and socially be intelligent. But I would help them with their relationships. Second strength is spirituality. I can connect and attune to spiritual and uh, spiritual things. I have a really clear sense of my purpose and my place in life. Third strength, character or perspective and wisdom. I can just see the principle a mile away. Fourth strength is creativity. Never do anything the same way twice. Fifth strength, love of learning. Hate school. Hated it. High school GPA 2.5. Thank you. And that was with a lot of hard work. But I blame it on my parents because they weren't there to force me to study. Then I got in college, and when I finally found out what I loved, I started getting into what I loved. And when I could get into what I loved and learn it the way I want to learn it, boom! Um, and my sixth strength, believe it or not, is fun, playful, and humorous. You are welcome. And so what I realized is my entire life, I was always having those strengths. I was always creative. I could always come up with another way to do something. I was always loving learning, but I hated the teacher. I was the only kid in my class in Spanish that got told off and sworn at in a foreign language. She so reamed me that I had to go look it up. And then when I realized, like, that was bad, I was going to tell my parents, but they wouldn't have cared. <laughs> they would have cared, but... We all have strengths in this room. So part of what we're going to try to do is figure out how to make any relationship that looks like that work together. And I'm going to suggest that the, the, the real key to it is not going to be any one thing. It's not going to be the cow. The cow is not the key. Nor is the dolphin. They're not the key. But what is the key to a relationship is something we're going to call the space between. So here's what I want to know. The space between. Everything that happens in between. Everything that happens in between you and those four people you wrote on your paper. Everything that happens in between you two creates that relationship, the space between. So here's what I want to know. And I'd love you to give us some insight, okay? What makes relationships so hard for you? What gets in the way in the space between? And let, if you don't want to talk about you, just tell me what makes it so hard for the person on your right. All right? What makes relationships so hard? Say it real loud. Expectations. expectations. Okay, what about it? Uh, we put our own expectations of what they should be doing. Yeah. Like the right thing. <laughs> Are you with him? He's on your right. He is. He is. Uh, <laughs> so, and you, ex you expect stuff. Does he know what you expect? Not unless I communicate it. Oh. <laughs> So now we're now into the second era. We've got to communicate what we need and want, right? And how many of you have an expectation that's actually not warranted? Or it's not right? How many of you don't even know what your expectations are until they're violated? <laughs> now he's violated my expectations. You know, I didn't know you needed that. Are you kidding? That's in the universal code. That's, that is universal to all good relating. My mom said you'd be trouble. <laughs> Here we go. Well, your mom's weird, all right? And I, and I mean that sincerely. She's sincerely weird. So now we're fighting about the expectation that you have or that your mom had. Oof, uh, that's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> Did you have a dad around? Uh, yes. What were his expectations? Oof. Um... Why'd you say oof? <laughs> I don't know. We'd have to unpack that, I think, yeah. you know. There's a lot. 
a lot. And we never talk about them. Because a lot of them are just put away on the shelf until when? Violated. Sometimes we don't know until when. They violate it. And then you have to do what? Fix them. Crack their skull. That's very violent. That's what my eight-year-old would say. Crack them. Expectations are huge. And the hardest part about an expectation is, and we're going to show you, most of them are what we're, call, we're going to call intangible. They're intangible. They're not even tangible. I, I want romance. Well, let's get going. Let's go to bed. Bed is not romance. Oh, yes, it is. Uh-uh. So now we fight about bed and romance. What do you want to bet the odds are you guys don't have the same idea on what romance is? I want you to want to take the garbage out. Well, I want you to want to get to bed. Well, I would get to bed if you took the garbage out. No, you wouldn't. I took the garbage out last night. We still have him in the bed. You're a liar. And now we're calling each other a liar. Now, I know you don't do this. You're killing it. But there's people that do this all the time, right? Expectations are huge. What else gets in the way of a healthy relationship? <laughs> Holy cow. Where's that kid hater? Who's the kid hater? Oh, you're with your wife. You still said it. Yeah. Kid. Oh, oh, they're blending families. How many kids do you guys have? Blended. Five together. You want to hear the coolest kid stat ever? Totally true, because I wouldn't make this stuff up. Every child you have decreases marital satisfaction by 20% per child. You two are in the crapper. Negative 25%. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that, and that's assuming everything was great. But kids can impact, can't they? But they're gifts from heaven. They're sent from heaven. To what? To suck the life out of us red rum red rum okay that's that's i just paid tribute to the shining okay that's murder backwards um and i know that sounds violent but kids we love them don't we you, oh do you remember how many of you have kids do you remember the babies are they so beautiful have you ever gone to a baby shower and you see all these like possessed mothers. <laughs> this is so true. I'm, this is what a PhD gets you is a lot of information no one needs to know. But this is so true. So babies emit pheromones. Okay, pheromones are just this, this sensory smell that your body can pick up that then makes your body create chemistry. We have them too. That's why if you've ever been to a bar and then you regretted who you took home. Some of that was pheromone. Some of that was just, I don't know, liquor. But you don't have to go to a bar to do it. You can also get it just walking across BYU campus. Because there's a ton of pheromone there. But babies emit a pheromone. And when the mother smells it, she wants a baby. And her brain is like, make a baby, make a baby, get a baby, get a baby. Which is why at a baby shower, they pass around a baby like it's a joint. And everybody, I know, I know. And they shouldn't. But everybody needs to take a toke on that baby. And they're all just like, and grandma's like, give me the baby, give me the baby. Grandma's like all strung out on the bathroom floor. Grandma needs a baby. You know, you're only laughing because you've been to these. And nobody knows that it's the pheromones, but no one's thinking about raising that child. 
They just want the baby, which is why every time my wife gets home from a shower, I hose her off, okay? <laughs> it's just a little bit of advice that I think you all ought to do. Hose those people off after baby showers, okay? And every time we'd have a baby, I wouldn't film my wife's face and I wouldn't film the baby. It wasn't allowed to go down south. Um, I had to stay up north and I would, I would kind of show her face, but I would like to show her during contractions. Just during the painful contractions. Generally, generally before they start doing all of the good blocking of pain, I want her to remember that with every beautiful gift from heaven comes a ton of pain. Now, it sounds negative, and it is. You'll also see it didn't matter because we still had six kids, okay? But these, this is so real. Kids impact. So what they find is, it's like a, it's, it's a weird you. We start really high in our relationships, and then as time goes on and we have kids, marital satisfaction goes down. And then as they age and get older, marital satisfaction goes up. And if we could just put what's in the middle causing all the trouble, it just would be your family picture. <laughs> Isn't that real? And it's, but you still love them. You want them. You want them. But you want them to leave. I have six kids, right? They're beautiful. And I want them to go. And then when they go, I'm like, where are you? Why don't you come around? And then they come around. I'm like, no, you got to go. You got to go. And then it's like, you never call. And then they call and I'm like, what? What? We just trying to say hi. You say to call. So we were calling. Oh, do you need money? You always do. We don't call for money, dad. But we kind of do need money. And so when they need money, then that means we have to go work. And work takes money and time and energy and effort. And it starts to divide us. And here's the sad truth. Um, we're now down to two kids at home. We got three kids married during COVID. Okay, don't tell me pandemics aren't good for families. Because <laughs> they were great for us. And um, we got, they got married. But the crazy thing about it is we're down to one who's in Honduras right now. And he'll be back in six months. And then we have another one, our 17, oh, 18. He just turned 18. And he didn't realize that at 18, he had to move out. He thought he was going to just finish high school. No. So um, we're trying to get that into his head. Apparently, his mom didn't teach him everything. And so um, that kid's going to be gone. And we're going to be empty nesters. And then you know what you're left with? A person you haven't talked to for 20 years. It's so awesome. Kids are huge impact. And they're good. And we want them, and it's a part of this, it's a part of the game, it's part of the plan, but they can impact unless you work on the relationship. Relationships are like the garden, you got to nurture it, you got to take care of it, otherwise the kids will come in and just eat everything, like, like a pack of wolves or deer, just munching on the garden. What else gets in the way? Kids, expectations, talked a little bit about communication, what else? Values. What do you mean? Yeah. The right values and their values. <laughs> you, like, you know values and those aren't. And there's, so how would a value get in the way though? Because we disagree on what the right value is. Yeah. So how do you create agreement on the right value? You know, I don't know. I've no, I was, oh, I, I don't either. I was hoping you would know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but like, think that through. And by the way, values, they're there. They've been there a long time, right? So I'm now marrying somebody and, and we thought we had the same values until the old, we call it in my business, the mate and switch. <laughs> it's terrifying. You thought we were totally together until we made it. And then once they've got their hooks in, they change the game. That's so unfair. So how do you negotiate that? Uh -huh. Stop talking to the in-laws. 
Stop, to get, yes, banish all in-laws. It's a great way to start. It's a great way to start. A lot of times they don't like that, but it's not about them. It's about you. But we're going to get into values because our, our values, they have to be negotiated. And this is what's weird. It's easy to know your val, and it's not really. It's easier to know your values if it's just you, right? But if it's you and them, how do we actually create shared values? There's only one way to do that, honestly. You have to create shared meaning. You have to make something mutual, shared. And I'll show you how. Really cool ways to do it. And it's going to take time. Just like blending a family. Does anybody know how long the experts say it takes to actually blend a family? Seven years. But it will feel like forever. Forever! So if you set the expectation that it's seven years, you'll have a different game than if you think it should be done now! Because I love her! She's your new mom! And that other mom is the spawn of darkness! And I mean that affectionately! Because her parents are dark! <clears throat> Now, I'll pick you up at five from your mom's. <laughs> so jacked up. Now, even the best, however this goes, it's still going to rattle the safety and security, and it's going to turn on the fight or flight of any of us. Right? And every one of us can have a situation where, where these things start to get in the way. Anything else that makes relationships hard? Please. We'll say it real loud. Mindset, what about it? Uh, growth. Look at her. Like, are you a sociologist, researcher? How do you know? You're quoting, so fixed mindset versus growth mindset. Have you all heard of that? Some of us are just born with, um, right? We're just born perfect. You just crush it. Fixed and growth mindset is very much about your expectation. Do you grow or are you fixed in your nature? And if you think you're fixed, you go about life in a very fixed way and you start competing more and you start, um, you kind of think you either married the right person or you didn't. Oh, married the wrong one. What makes them so wrong? Virtually everything. <laughs> but how did you overlook all of that? Well, she was mesmerizing me with her magnetism. Fixed mindset means it's set. Growth mindset means we learn, we change, we grow. And so our mindset about how we approach it. So if growth, if relationships are developmental, here's, by the way, the best model I've ever seen of a relationship is it's a seed. And if the seed is good, right, and we plant the seed and we nurture the seed and we take care of the seed, the seed will grow. What is the problem, though, is can you, if you don't understand the seed, then you may not know how to nurture it. And by not knowing and or understanding that seed or that type of seed, you might nurture it inappropriately. You might over-nurture it. Or as it starts to grow, you might pick it up to check its roots. Yep, they're there. And all of a sudden, we're harming the process. Or if you don't trust the seed, here's a cool truth. In, when in a relationship or in our lives, that seed has the power to grow on its own. Do you believe that? Do seeds need gardeners more or do gardeners need seeds more? Seeds don't need gardeners. I have never planted a weed and they're growing like cray cray in my yard. <laughs> seeds actually can grow with or without you. But gardeners need a seed. That's a killer parenting model. Your kids are a seed and you're the gardener. Your job is to create optimal conditions for growth. Period. And as soon as you're managing optimal conditions, then we allow the seed to do the growth. And then when, there, when the seed turns into this incredible tree, don't take credit for it. Because you did nothing. That seed did all the growth. So we always credit the other. That's called accountability. You allow this accountability to be on that seed, not on you. Eventually in our relationships, it's the same way. We have to nurture the seed. We have to take care of the seed. We have to understand our partner. We have to...